Cool, cool. There we go. So, um, in order to understand mechanics of breathing, we got to understand uh, a couple things. We have to understand that there are three different pressures. People like to say, oh, when you take a breath, you create negative pressure. That's a really vague term because negative pressure intrathoracically, you know, there are three different parts of the intrathoracic space, right? There's the pleural space, which is the space between the green visceral pleura and the purple parietal pleura. There's the alveolar pressure, which is the actual pressure inside the lung. And then there's your atmospheric pressure on the outside. And so the first thing we need to do is address those three pressures. So the first thing we need to know is that the pressure of the atmosphere is 760 millimeters of mercury, which, you know, hopefully a lot of people remember. Uh, the next thing we need to remember is that the pressure of the alveoli when we're not moving any air is also 760. And the reason is that there's no valve between the atmosphere and your lungs. If you're not moving any air, you just sit there, don't breathe in or out. So they should be the same. And then the pressure in the pleural space is actually about 757. It's slightly lower than the pressure in the alveoli. And so the question, the first thing we need to address is, well, why is that the case? Um, it obviously has to be a little bit lower than the pressure in the alveoli in order to keep the lung expanded because if the pressure inside this pleural space were higher, it would cause a lung collapse, which is what happens when you have a hemothorax, pneumothorax, whatever else. And so the thing we need to look at is why. So uh, we all hopefully may or may not remember that pressure is equal to force over area. So that's why if I go like this to somebody or like this to somebody, when you're over a small area, the pressure is much higher, it's more uncomfortable. When you push with an open palm, the area is larger, so the pressure is decreased. In three dimensions, PV equals NRT, which means that pressure is equal to NRT over volume. If we assume this to be a constant, then as your volume changes, your pressure changes. So if volume increases, pressure drops and vice versa, right? So the question is really, how do we increase the volume of the pleural space in order to decrease its pressure? So it happens by three main mechanisms and I kind of drew it up here. So it might be a little hard to see, I apologize. There are two green arrows going in and one going out and the green here is the visceral pleura and the purple is the parietal pleura. So there are two forces that pull the lung in. The first one is elastin, which this is just a function of the elast elastin protein that is between the uh, alveoli and the interstitium, and that uh, is what allows the lung to recoil. And that's probably the primary problem in like COPD. You destroy the interstitium, the alveoli uh, can't recoil, and so they just kind of distend and you get air trapped. Right? The next one is surface tension. So remember that alveoli are all connected to one another in like these clusters and there should be a want of them to collapse from a smaller one into a larger one, larger one to a smaller one, etc. And that's a function of their surface tension and wanting to collapse. But instead, that doesn't happen because we have surfactant. So those two forces pull the visceral pleura away from the parietal pleura. And the chest wall on the outside pulls the parietal pleura away from the visceral pleura. So hopefully that makes sense that that little kind of pulling apart of those two layers results in this increased volume in that space, which leads to a decrease in pressure in that space and allows the lung to remain expanded. So when we take a breath, what happens is your diaphragm contracts and moves downward here. Your chest wall moves up and out, and these motions pull the parietal pleura further away from the visceral pleura. That increases your volume in the pleural space. That means your pressure in the pleural space drops, and when the pressure in the pleural space drops, the alveoli then have less pressure on them from the pleural space, so they can go and expand and the same thing, as they expand, their volume goes up, their pressure goes down. And now, before you had 760 out here, 
and you had 760 inside, but now you have 760 and 757 in here, and air can move passively down into the alveoli. So that's what happens when you mechanically take a breath. You drop your diaphragm, you expand your chest wall and your, your um, uh, pull the parietal pleura further away from the visceral pleura. That in turn increases the volume, decreases the pressure, and allows the alveoli to expand. So that's how we take a normal breath, and it's important to understand that because that has a lot of implications. Remember that your heart sits in here, and so there are pressures that push on your heart that change venous return and, and cardiac output and um, all those kinds of things. So that's the basics, basic mechanics of breathing. So now really what we want to talk about today is the uh, chest tubes. So I've drawn three bottles, and this is because chest tubes that we use today are based off of the three bottle system. So everything that I'm going to talk about here is actually inside the box that you guys all use, um, be it an oasis or a ocean. Um, uh, uh, oh my God. Container. Um, so the first bottle is called the collection bottle. The second bottle is called the water seal, which you guys are familiar with. And the third is the suction. So first things first, the collection bottle. So you get a hole in your lung somewhere here, and now air can escape, and it starts to increase the pleural pressure, intrapleural pressure, and that leads to lung collapse. So what do we do? We jam a chest tube in. We make a hole here, and we put this tube that has these fenestrations in it, in, and has these little holes all over the side, and we plug it into, once upon a time, our collection bottle. And the collection bottle is meant to do two things. One, it's meant to collect stuff. So remember, you have pleural fluid. If you have blood in there, it's going to fall out and it's going to collect at the bottom here. Now, I drew this up here, the straw being short, and that's important because if the straw were to be long, say all the way down here, as you fill up your bottle, the pressure in the straw is gonna go up and you won't drain anything anymore. So the way to think about the collection bottle is that it's basically an expansion of your pleural space. This whole tubing is, con is contiguous with the collection bottle, and now you have one large space, so your volume went up, your pressure goes down, and just by plugging it into the collection bottle, you have this drop in pressure which immediately allows the lung to re-expand. But at some point, air will continue to enter into the space, and even though your pleural space got bigger, you're going to eventually fill the bottle with air or whatever's coming out, and the pressures will equalize and it will start to um, collapse the lung again. So the next part we need to do is attach this bottle to another bottle, and this is called our water seal bottle. And I'm drawing this straw longer because it needs to be inside the water. So it's called the water seal because as air drains out, it's going to travel down, up here, across, down the tubing, and then it's going to form bubbles, because that's what air does. And then those bubbles are going to release air into the you know, atmosphere, basically, of the water seal bottle. So why is that important? Well, it creates what we call a one-way valve. Remember that. It's a one-way valve because bubbles that have dropped their air, once they've bubbled out, that air can't go back up into this system. So as soon as air is evacuated from here into the collection bottle, into the water seal, the air cannot go back into this. And so we go ahead and plug in the water seal. And so in theory, without even putting them to suction or really doing anything else, as soon as we plug our chest tube in, we can put them to water seal because air will drain down out, bubble out, and won't re-enter the system. And sometimes right away, your lung is re-expanded and you're good. Um, not everyone gets put to suction. A lot of people do, it's you know, up to whoever the practitioner is, but that's what's going on. You put them to water seal and the air is bubbling out. Now, the last part of this is eventually, air will accumulate in here and it will exert a pressure down on the water and then 
no more bubbles will come out because now it's pushing down on the water, which is pushing up here and will prevent more bubbles from forming and air won't be able to go down. So what do we do? We plug it into our last bottle, which is our suction canister. Now, our suction canister is hooked up here to suction. And then there's this big straw that comes down the middle, which is exposed to the atmosphere. Okay. And it's dumped into water and we all hopefully maybe know that we usually set our, our um, suction to 20. And basically what happens is, is imagine inside this bottle there's air, because there is, and it's, it's pushing down on the water because it's, that's what the atmosphere does. It pushes down on the water in the suction. And some of you who use the Oasis rather than water, you have like this accordion looking thing, right? And the idea with suction is that we're going to suck air out of the chamber such that the atmosphere can exert pressure and drop the water level. Now, once upon a time, you couldn't dial in how much suction you needed. So what they did was they would fill the straw. If any of you have ever gone to a restaurant when you're kids, or even now, sometimes I do it, and you put your straw in the glass and you try to blow bubbles, if the water level is very low, that means you only have to overcome maybe two, three centimeters worth of water. But if you dunk it all the way so it fills up the whole glass, it's much harder to overcome that whole column to blow bubbles. So imagine as you pull air out from above the water column, the atmosphere can now push pressure down and it can bubble out. Well, as you apply suction, any amount of suction, less than 20 centimeters of water, you won't get any bubbling because the water level say at, 15, at 10 would drop to here and 15 would drop to here and 19 would drop to here, but would not allow any actual air to enter the system. But as soon as you hit 20, now you can start bubbling out. And that's when you start to see bubbling in the system. And what that does is it starts evacuating air here in order to maintain your gradient to allow um, air to continue to drain down. It's all about creating gradients. And any less than 20 centimeters worth water worth of suction, you won't get any bubbling. Or in the case of um, the accordions that you guys see, as you suck air out away from the accordion, the accordion can expand. But once you take the suction off, the pressure inside will cause it to collapse again. And many of you probably have seen that on the, um, you know, in your, in your uh, practice. So now the question is, what do we do? We put the patient to water seal. So what does that mean? We basically get rid of our connection to suction and we see, we wanna see if the lung is completely re-expanded and there's no more air entering the system and coming down here and bubbling out, it means that there's no more air entering into the system and that the lung is expanded. So that's what it means when we take the patient off suction and put them to water seal. Um, once upon a time, you also could have just set them up to a, a collection and hoped that they expanded enough. And that's what they did, you know, kind of once upon a time. So the other thing you're going to hear people say and do is they're going to look for continuous air leaks. That's what it's called when your water seal continues to bubble. And what they're looking for is ways air could be entering into the system along here. So the most obvious way is, well, you still have this hole in the lung and air is still getting out. And as air gets out, it's going to enter into those holes and it's going to enter the system and continue to bubble. Great, that's the first thing. So the next thing, so you always check your x-ray and see, oh, well, they still have this big pneumothorax. That's why we're still bubbling. The next thing we can do is Sometimes, you know, patients move and you can get those speculations, those little holes may be outside the chest wall. Now you have the atmosphere exerting pressure and that's going to cause air to enter into the system. So you're always going to see the intensivist or the surgeon or the PA or whoever's there and something obviously anyone else can do. You take down the dressing and you look and you see, is my chest tube inside the chest wall still? Remember, don't put something back in that's already come out because it's, it's dirty out here and you don't want to introduce that into the wall. So we take down the dressing, we look and make sure there's no holes outside and we can see it a lot of times on x-ray too. And the other two things you're going to hear are check your connections because remember we have an adapter usually about here and there's an adapter here and anywhere you're able to enter air, so a loose connection that's open to the atmosphere will allow air to enter in and cause bubbling to occur in the water seal. 
And all of this stuff is happening inside that container that you guys have at the bedside. And so, yeah, that's it.